Welcome everyone to the EL Civics Network meeting for California for August 2023. My name is Lori Howard. I'm CASA's Program Specialist Coordinator specializing in IELCE, and I'm thrilled to be with you today. We have a number of presenters. Portia LaFerla, Program Specialist, is also with me today to talk about citizenship prep. And we have Janice Farah and Cara Evans also, and I'll be introducing them in a second. Um, if you haven't already done so, please type your name and agency in the chat box. And also, if you haven't already done so, please, uh, after the meeting, register at caadultedtraining.org. That helps me a lot to keep track of your attendance and show that your agency is participating in these meetings. And if you're not receiving a meeting reminder from me, if you didn't receive one on Monday, uh, email me your address at lbhoward.casas.org if you want to be on my EL Civics Network meeting list. And I'll be reminding you, and those are the people I send the slides to, and um, all the other information from the meeting. So it's great to be with you today. I hope you're having a happy summer. Uh, and I'm thrilled that you're here even so early in the year. Let me just share with you our agenda. And then if you want to add to it, we can talk about it. We're going to do a CDE update today, some information that we gleaned from the statewide meeting yesterday. Um, we'll talk about some CASAS information, and we're going to share with you about STEPS, uh, the ESL assessment. We talked about it at our last meeting, and there were some questions about when to start. So we have Jenna's uh, Janice Farah here today, who is our National Program and Technology Specialist, and she'll be telling you about uh, the STEPS test and how you can get started. And we also have uh, a presentation on CASAS e-test accessibility features, and we have Cara Evans here, who's the Assessment Specialist and tech Test Accommodations Lead, and she'll be helping you with that. So that's going to be our first 15 minutes or so. Then we'll get into civic participation, ILCE information. And then lastly, our citizenship prep information. Does anybody have anything they want to add to the um, agenda? <coughs> okay, then we'll get started. And again, uh, you can chat to me or you can... Uh, uh, unmute if you have if you need to communicate. So let me just make sure pull up my chat here. There we go. Okay, we're going to start with a CDE update. And um, so I hope a number of you were at the statewide meeting yesterday. Uh, they talked about this the 2023-24 beginning of the year letter. Uh, they said that it was available at the CDE website, and here is the link. All the links here are live, and I will send you the slides uh, after the meeting if you're on my EL Civics list. Um, I also sent you uh, yesterday uh, a letter that came from OTAN uh, that had a lot of the important information of the year. Again, if you were on my list uh, yesterday, uh, you got it in the mail, and that has a lot of the information about uh, all the beginning of the year letter. So uh, hopefully you've got that and that someone from your agency is going to these statewide meetings um, and uh, bringing that information back to you. So either either going to the meeting or they're accessing the meeting afterwards. So this I'm, this link goes to this part of the CASAS website, training and support, and you can see the network meeting recordings here. Yesterday's meeting was not post has not posted yet, but they said it would be there today. So if you didn't have a chance to go to the meeting yesterday, I highly suggest that you go to this uh, part of the CASAS website and click on the link that will be here, hopefully by the end of the day. Any questions? And if you didn't get that email from me yesterday because you weren't on my list yesterday, just let me know when you send me your email address that you also want that uh, letter yesterday that talked about a lot of beginning of the year information. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, great. Then let's move on to our presentation. So we're going to start out talking about STEPS, our new ESL assessment. Again, we have Janice Farah here, and we have her email address in case you need to email her at some future point um, to ask her any questions. Uh, 
Janice, are you here? I am. Okay, great. I'm going to stop sharing and you're going to share your slides, right? Yes, I will. I just want to say thank you, Lori, for inviting me today. The new steps rollout has just been going gangbusters. We announced it July 17th that all agencies are able to use it. And the rollout of training and information is still kind of catching up to that initial announcement. So what Lori and I prepared for you today is kind of a handout because I know not everybody is really interested in the intricacies of how does it look in TE or, you know, what do I do in e-test to make it work? Um, so what we've done is create four handouts. And what I want to start with today, I, I, probably a lot of you were at Summer Institute and uh, Linda Taylor and I shared uh, what we called the cost assessment update. And we talked about what was coming and now it's here. So I've taken that presentation. Um, that's one of the handouts I'll share with you. And I've updated the slides that have changed since then. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. And I'm not going to, it's not going to be death by PowerPoint today, I promise. We'll just do a few slides that I think summarize it. There it is. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, first off, let's all say it together, STEPS. What does STEPS stand for? It's the Student Test of English Progress and Success. Easy to remember, and the good news is it's all ready to go. And I think one of the most important things about the new STEPS assessment is that it's culturally relevant. And we think that the test items kind of frame more things that are re um, relevant and interesting to students. So they're not talking about telephones with wires attached to them anymore. Um, things more like uh, troubleshooting a Wi-Fi system or reading an email. We're very happy about that. And then the testing process is also changed slightly because we believe that by having five levels, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute, is going to lead to increased scoring accuracy. Um, you'll be able to count those measurable skills gains and some new reports. So um, with everything that's new comes the training. So I'll share with you some of the, the interesting factoids and then give you some directions on where to go to get more. So this is a slide that's changed since Summer Institute, because now we know that the uh, reading steps and listening steps are released as of July 17th. They're in the National Register. They're ready for you to download. Um, and also that the old Life and Work series, which was originally only scheduled through February, the NRS has granted us through the end of June. So agencies that have a lot of things they need to get in place before they <laughs> dive in, they have a little bit more time. And it coincides with the end of the program year. So I think those are two good things to point out that are different since Summer Institute. Uh, let's see what we got. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about math goals, but I would be remiss to not mention that it's also in there too, in, in the collection of new things to look at. So I'm gonna kind of scroll down through the slides a little bit. Now I'm on slide 16, uh, a little bit deeper look. When you talk about reading steps, the old version of Life and Work was four levels. The new steps is five. A, B, C, D, and E. It's also levels one through six as far as the NRS levels are concerned. But the new thing is that what we are aligned with is now the English language proficiency standards. Okay, so there's a little bit of a learning curve to understand what some of that vocabulary is, and it's in this PowerPoint. Similarly, next slide down, the listening steps is also five levels corresponding to the NRS levels one through six, and it is also aligned to the ELP standards. Lots of diagrams. And if you go to casas.org, down in the lower right corner, there's a section called what's new. You can always go there and bring up lots of information. There's these new things called blueprints. Uh, there's copies of these sort of documents and, and lots of information for you to chew on. If your teachers want to get into more details, um, there's a um, the, a revised version of like module four coming. It's not there yet. I'll get into that in a second. Let's see. Uh, oh, that's math goals. So I'm just going to scroll down a little bit farther. Kind of a good thing to think about is what's changed and what hasn't. So much of it is all still the same. We still need our proctors to be certified. Um, you have testing sessions and e-tests. The new thing is we have paper uh, booklets available for um, the locator and the appraisal. Now, the printer is behind schedule. So I apologize if there's anybody out there that's just... <gasps> Uh, chomping at the bid for that, I suggest you send an email to orders at casas.org and get in the queue so that when it finally does arrive and the shipping department rips it open, you're already in there ready to go. Uh, let's see what else is in here. 
Um, right. So NRS, still the same game, right? You need pre-tests and post-tests. And the big thing to remember is they need to match. And that's just the rules. So if the student has a pre-test, and I know we're going to start getting into the rat hole, if they get a pre-test in life and work, the post-test needs to also be life and work. And you can change that up in the middle of the school year if you want to retest some students starting in January with the new series and then post-test them in June. If they're a high attendance student, you can do that. Okay. Um, and of course, with EL Civics, because this is the group I'm talking to today, um, no gain is required in order to achieve California payment points for a co-op. You just need to have that pre and post. And it doesn't matter if it's a steps pre and post or a life and work pre and post. Okay. We've done a lot of updates to the logic inside the TE reports so that this is all um, in there and functional and working. I predict we'll be having a bunch of TE releases as we get to the end of the first quarter, you know, as CASA shakes out all the little details and things. Let's take another look. Um, so there's new form numbers. Got to get used to it. If you've already memorized it, I'm sorry. Now you're going to have to memorize new numbers. But the good news is the reading and the listening. Um, are the same pairs of numbers. So like level A is 621 R or L for reading or listening uh, and 622. And it goes down like that. Uh, the second document that Lori and I are gonna share with you is the super nice, it's a just a two page summary of a whole bunch of the data that's in the slides I've shared with you so far. It even includes things like the number of test questions, we call those test items, and the duration, which is the number of minutes. So, you know, as the tests get a little bit harder at level C, D, E, the number of minutes goes up. And so anyway, in this one document, it's just two pages long and it's your new cheat sheet. So you don't have to keep copies of this, <laughs> of this PowerPoint uh, taped up on your bulletin board. So that's the reading and duration, uh, reading steps, duration, and test items. And for listening, might be important to take a little look at, let's see, where was that? There was um, some of the cutoff scores are different. Is that, I'm trying to find the right slide here. Arg. I, I might have gone past it already, but anyway, there's a blue column and it talks about what the cutoff scores as you go from level, you know, A to B to C. And so that's, those are new numbers. It's in the cheat sheet. Let's see. Um, as we align to the new ELPS, there's some new reports and vocabulary that are worth learning. So for example, reading steps, there are five different uh, content categories vocabulary, details, main idea, inference, and point of view. So as you go from reading to listening, the first three are the same. So you still have vocabulary, details, and main idea. But now, because you're listening, you're listening for a summary and for dialogue. And there's tons of great listening uh, sample things. I think there's like 250 meg out there on uh, on casas.org. So if you want to listen to what some of the samples are, because now we don't say next line, we'll say next response, which is actually a better way to do it. There's also some summary questions in this PowerPoint, lots of examples. I don't want to bore you with that. Let's see if there's anything else I need to cover in here. Oh, okay. So we talk about reports that are changing. Okay. This is, um, let me go back two slides. We got input from you, from the agencies. We took some psychometric consulting, which is that division of CASAS that sits over on the other side of the room that, I don't know, they're, they're a, a very special a statistical breed. Um, we also looked at best practices in reporting and just some changes that we, CASAS sees in the uh, adult education landscape. And when we put that all together, we said, we're gonna make some changes to the reports. First of all, we're gonna remove anything that goes item by item because we really don't want people testing, teaching to the test. So we don't want a report that shows that Johnny got these answers on questions one, two, three, four. There's other ways to get information that goes into that level of detail. And we're really happy with the new reports. Um, there's also no more content standard reporting and there's no more three digit competency reporting. Okay, Lori, am I going too long? I'm watching for you and I, oh, you're, you have your- Fine. Okay, thank you. So charging along, if you think about the reports that you frequently use, and everybody's frequently used reports are a little different, but uh, the ones that we hear the most about, like the scoring reports, personal score report, it's still there. And now it'll show what, you know, whatever test the student has taken, whatever combination, it could be the, you know, life and work and that, you know, so it goes through the whole history. 
Next assigned test is smart enough to know that if the student is a brand new student to your agency and you gave them the new steps report, that the next assigned report, uh, next assigned test will also be a steps test, right? To keep the pairs together. Learning gains, uh, test, uh, student test summary, et cetera. I think the individual skills profile is kind of a neat one to look at. I'm trying to see in this presentation if I have a copy of it. Uh, competency area, task area. Okay, so what we had to do, because not all, all agencies are moving at the same time, we had to make some changes in TE. Okay, so this is kind of a scary picture, but don't let it get to you. The green parts are the parts that are changing. So underneath like the competency performance, there's a few reports that are gonna look a little bit different. Um, this slide was from Summer Institute, but what I did, we had a new release of TE, I think two of them last week. And so sometimes I publish these annotated release notes that go into lots and lots of detail about what we changed in TE. I know sometimes when you look at the release notes, they're cryptic and they don't, they don't really tell you how to use it. So that's what I do. I go in and I do screenshots and I have a little commentary and Lori's gonna share that with you also. It talks a little bit about, actually, I think I'll pop it up real quick on the screen not too hard. So it looks like this. It's the annotated TE release notes. Oops, my mouse is crazy. Annotated TE release notes. And I'll take the release note piece and then I'll talk about it a little bit like, what, what is that proxy wizard again? And then I'll show maybe a screenshot of this is how you do the scheduler. <clears throat> and this is the part that this group might care about because when we're talking about the new reports for steps and goals two, these are the new reports. And it reminds you about when they're helpful. And then there's some samples. And then there's the reminder about the ones that are going away. And the way that we annotated them in TE, hopefully you can see this, see where the little red arrows are? If there's an asterisk next to the name of the report, that report doesn't work on steps data. That's a report that's based on the old world of things. And we've allowed the old and the new to kind of coexist as agencies get through this year, right? getting, because uh, not everybody's up to speed on the new stuff yet. So we've got the old and the new, and eventually um, we might have to pull those out and put them in a different category under. So if you look in TE, I'm under reports, CASAS e-tests here. Janice, we have a couple of con uh, yeah. questions, if that's all right. So sure, Crystal, sure. Crystal says, I'm concerned about losing class-wide skills and competency reports for my ESL students. I use them frequently. Uh, well, there's a lot of different ways to get that information using the new ones. It's not that we've banished them completely, it's that we've changed them. And that's part of uh, the discussion that's coming. I think uh, the training team at CASAS is feverishly working alongside with the printers um, on what's the training modules to teach agencies exactly how to do that. So um, Lydia's comment about the, the new reports are pretty legit. I thank you, Lydia. I believe they are too. They go into a lot of detail. I also have a request in with the developers to please put a set of sample reports on casas.org. And that will help alleviate your concerns about what it can and can't do. I Janice, one more. I don't know if this is the same question that Crystal had, but Hillary said that they gave the steps last night. Oh, yeah. Personal score report came up at the end. It no longer had a description of students' abilities. Is that the same thing that Crystal was referring to? No, that's okay. a different one. And because boy, we've been be returning. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say too much, but we've been arm wrestling this exact question, Hillary, about hey, where'd that go? How did the personal the how did the we call everything by the acronyms? How did the PSR lose its paragraph? And the current answer is, please use the uh, individual skills profile instead of the PSR for now, because it goes into a lot of detail and it doesn't, I know it doesn't have that summary. Um, we're still lobbying for getting it back. So um, if you could send an email to tech support at casas.org and reiterate that might help my case a little bit, because I agree, the report comes up and it's got the, the, we call it the thermometer bar and it's got the data, but it doesn't have any, you know, description. And there's with teacher portal coming and the revisions that go with those reports, there's a lot going on at CASAS right now about what are we going to put in a report and where are we going to put it? So yeah, good, good feedback. Thank you. Oh, Lydia likes the ISP. Oh, much more detail and better for student. Okay. All right. And they wanted to know if they can still filter out inactive students. Will they still be able to oh, yeah. do that? 
Yep. There's it's the, it's still got that uh, general settings window with a thousand and one different things. And then down the left side, you've got the navigator bar and you can, you can say, I just want these these students that have these qualities. And then you run the report. Yep. It's also got that. What's that really cool feature? Um, break on form level or just give me the results for the entire class instead of, you know, 65 pages for each of your students. It'll glom them all together, kind of concatenate it. Very cool. So anyway, that's the annotated TE release notes. Oh, I'll give you a peek. This is that little two-page handout that I mentioned about uh, the cheat sheet for steps and goals forms. And it just sort of looks like this. And it goes down. It's got listening steps. All right. So it's TE reports. We talked about the annotated release notes. Um, so um, the answer is, if you want to do it now, there are agencies doing it now. And let me just stop sharing because I'm um i did a little test yesterday i went on the california server and i used my <laughs> super user privileges and i said show me all the agencies that have been doing steps testing so anybody want to take a well it's, it's hard in zoom with 86 people but um i was guessing maybe 600 steps tests so far guess how many there were i'll take three guesses in the chat and then i'll, I'll give you an answer over a thousand yeah i was over a thousand uh, no, Kristen, not yet. We're not at 6,000 yet. About 2,200 steps tests as of yesterday. And that's only since it's been released, not just not for the whole month of July, but those two weeks since the 17th when we officially, you know, enabled everything. And then just for, you know, kind of curiosity's sake, I said, how many life and work ESL tests have been administered by agencies? And some agencies have been doing both, right? Because they have, there's a, there's a discussion about how do you want to start? Do you want to take the whole agency and put them in the hot, deep water? Or do you want to start off with just some students? So guess how many ESL tests of life and work we've had so far? Any guesses? Oh, you guys, 3,700. That was the number I came up with when I searched. I, I took out all the appraisals. I took out all the locators. I just said, you know, how many tests came up? So, so Janice, we have one question. Will the new reports be on the teacher portal? Ah, uh, you know, uh, yes, but not yet. Okay. Yes, but not yet. That's and the then answer. There's a lot of very positive feedback from uh, overall the new test and new locator were very much better and easier to administer. So we have some nice comments there. I'll let you look at afterwards. I will. And let me just ask the question um, of the ones that, that thought that the locator was better. What level of ESL student was that? Was that lows, mids, or highs? Oh, and the loop is gone. I don't know about the loop. Lydia, don't tell me that. <laughs> you know, if anybody wants to put that in the chat, that would be helpful just to us to for me to feed back to the the uh, was, uh, well, if I could just jump in. That was me. Um, we did it last night. And the nice thing was that the locator, instead of having to like have students basically fail and then put them in the pre-lit test, mm -hmm. our lower level students were able to get right into the level test that they needed. Um and so that was a huge, huge improvement. We had all levels of students testing last night and it was really smooth. Excellent, excellent. So, th so the question is, if you wanna get started, what do you do? So you send an email and it's not to tech support, although if you send it to tech support, they'll forward it. Um, tech support is still really busy finishing end of year and steps came out at the same time. So we engaged a different team within CASAS called Go Live. that's G-O-L-I-V-E, at casas.org and they've got like a canned set of instructions on if you want to uh, create your testing sessions yourself or modify them or you just want to load ours thank you Lori. i see that in the chat email them they'll give you the, the the basics on it if you have any questions call up tech support and they can help you with the final part of it and that's pretty much it there's also a handout i'm going to share about um the newest co-app that Lori and Portia created, thank you, Lori and Portia, it's called 37.6, and it uses the essay component, which is a brand new assessment from CASAS, and I'm not going to spend any more time on that, but hats off, it is Fairfield Sassoon here. I want to say thank you so much. They administered it at the last minute in like May of last year, and they got like 15 students through it, and they all passed. So thank you very much for being the pioneers. Hats off. Okay, I'm done. Thank you so much. Thank Email you, Dan. We really appreciate you coming on board to tell us, give us more detailed information on the STEPS test. We're so lucky to have our new test approved by NRS and ready to go. Uh, again, 
it's going to incorporate the college and career readiness standards, the English language proficiency standards. So it's gonna be a, a really great measure of the improvements you've made in your curriculum over the last year since those beautiful documents have come out. Um, Janice did a great job telling you about it. And if you do have any further questions or comments, I, I, as she was asking for comments as well, if you took it and you have something to say about it or you want um, certain um, reports that may not be there, it's great to let, let Janice know and, and that helps her in uh, putting the finger on what people, what the, what people need. So her email is here, jfarah at casas.org. So um, I hope you got your questions answered. We're gonna move on to our CASAS e-test accessibility features. So this is something new um, that we want to share with you. Uh, about accessibility and Kara uh, is here with us. Kara, are you are you got your, we have your screen on? Hi everyone. Okay, great. And you would like me to share your the video right away, right before you speak, or would you like to say something? Um, yeah, we can watch the video. It's about eight minutes, so we'll watch that together. And then if any participants have questions at the end, I can certainly answer those. Okay, Thanks, Lori. Right. So I'm going to show a video. Hopefully you can see that. This training video covers some new accessibility features that are available in CASAS eTest. When agencies roll over to the new take a test option, these features will be available. So what's an accessibility feature? Accessibility features are designed to help people with disabilities use technology more easily. Though these are technically available to all test takers. This is a list of the new features, but instead of going through them here, I'll talk you through screen captures and a demo. You'll have this list of features as a resource, however, if you need it. It's important to have a conversation with test takers ahead of time to find out what is needed for accessibility. That way you can build in the time to accommodate this and get it set up in Lori, you've muted and we can't hear the sound. An accommodation testing session ahead of time. Just before the test begins, the test taker signs in and clicks on the red gear icon in the upper right hand corner. This opens up the accessibility toolkit. In the upper left hand corner, the test taker can see three options for default text size. The size they see on their screen is the size they will see when they begin the test. This is just the default text size or their starting size. The test taker can use magnification icons to make the text even bigger from there as needed. Next, on the right-hand side are the color combinations, specifically the background color and the text color of the directions page, practice items, question and answer options. So for example, you can see here, this is a white background with black text yellow background with black text. And then down here, this is white background with like a royal blue text. These pre-configured color combinations are colors that are helpful for those test takers with disabilities, such as some processing or reading disabilities, dyslexia, color blindness. Once the test taker selects the color combination, it will be previewed here on the left. So you can see the size and the color selected is shown here. And this is how it will look when you start the test. One last note about this screen is the disable default keyboard shortcuts checkbox. So down here, CASA Z-Test can be navigated using keyboard only, so no mouse. And this is helpful for some test takers who don't use a mouse. There are keyboard shortcuts that are built in for this purpose. The proctor will check this box, however, when a test taker who is visually impaired or blind is using a screen reader. A screen reader is external assistive technology that allows a test taker to not only hear the text being read, but also navigate the test independently. 
using special keys on the key keyboard that are unique to that screen reader. So when done with the accessibility tool clip, toolkit, excuse me, you just click save and it's all set. The other way to set this up is in the management console. So test coordinators will have had you know, a conversation with the test taker to know what he or she needs, um, or they can set it up with the test taker present. So maybe this test taker also needs extended time uh, as part of their accommodations. So when the test coordinator is setting up a specialized accommodation test session for time and a half, say as an example, they can also go to the menu under accessibility and make selections in the toolkit that are applied only to that test session for that test taker. So now I'll demo the accessibilities toolkit. So here you can see this is the test menu screen in CASA's eTests. And up in the right hand corner, there's this red gear icon that I mentioned before. So I'll click on that. And this is our toolkit. So you can see we've got the text size, the color combinations. Um, and so I'm going to select the largest default text size and I'll select option three. So that's like a salmon color background with black text. I'm gonna preview that. Okay, so that's what it's going to look like when I start the test. I'm going to save. And then I'll start the test. Okay, so you can see the directions page. That large text has been applied as well as the color combination. And so this is a practice item here for steps, reading steps. So a few notes, um, the pre-selected customized text applies to the directions, the test questions, the answer options. It does not apply to the display images. So this is the display, what we call the display. And this is because the displays are actual images. They're not HTML. However, CASAS follows universal design principles when developing test item displays. And um, according to the Center for Universal Design, UD is the design of products and environments, so including testing environments, to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. So this includes things like you know, minimum text size, universally readable fonts, use of blank space around the text, um, proper contrast between background and text color, so things like that. And then also in terms of text size on this display, on this left side panel here, um, you can use the magnification feature. And these icons you know, will make it as large as needed to the toolkit if you have any feedback or want to share some ideas that you'd like to see in the toolkit you can reach out to um, causes at causes.org and suggest some ideas there thanks so much. okay thank you i appreciate having that i'm going to go back to the slides uh, any questions for kara I see one in the chat. Okay, great. Uh, will these features also work using the Chromebook app or will they only uh, or only take a test in Windows? Uh, that's a good question. Somehow these new um, accountability accessibility features are built into eTests and it kind of triggers it somehow when, um, when you roll over to take a test. So I did send an email to our developer and I guess, Laura, I could get that back to you and then you could share with the group in some way, would that work? Sure, sure, I, I'll send anything and I'll be sending, well, the, these these slides um, uh, are on the CASAS website, is that correct? Or or not, or do I need to send, will I be sending these also of the accessibility? Not yet, but I can get this um, at, yeah, available as a resource. There's a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Um, 
kind of, you know, goes with the video. So I can get that to you. Okay. And then there's another question. Did I hear that correctly? The student is going to the setting. So ideally, again, you've had this conversation ahead of time. The student says, you know, I want to preview it myself, you know, before I start the test, you build in time for that. The proctor is probably present. The student, they're kind of walking the student through. They show the student where the gear icon is. The student goes in. They're very familiar with, you know, looking for that text size. And then um, typically, you know, those color combinations are sort of standard um, for accessibility. So they would select that and then just save it. So it's, it's the screen, you know, before you start the test. So the student has logged in. They're sitting there at the station and and uh, certainly proctor support is, is appropriate too, as needed. So um, I think, you know, just that's the importance of having that conversation ahead of time. And so everyone's building in that time to make sure that there's time to set those settings. Um, yeah, so it's the proctor and student together. So yeah, that's a good clarification. Any other questions today? Okay. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thanks Thank for having you so, me, Lori. Thank you so much for, for uh, being here, for answering questions. This is such an important, you know, with the EL Civics Exchange, we want things to be accessible. And we, of course, want our tests to be accessible uh, as well and all of our all of the curriculum materials that you are developing. And so this is an important feature we, we wanted you to hear about. So thank you so much, Kara, for being here today and telling us about that. Welcome. Thanks. So here we go. So now um, we'll move on to civic participation in IELCE, sort of in two parts. I want to sort of give you some new information, and then I want to review how to access the CASAS website since we are all starting uh, in the new program year. So just to tell you that all the documents on the EL Civics page have been updated for the uh, program year 2023-24, and that happened as of July 1. Excuse me, I'm, I'm going to sneeze. Ah. Okay, and that now is the time for you to start selecting co-ops, and uh, just so that you, I'm going to show you how to do that in a second, but just so you know that no major changes have been made uh, to, on a wide basis, one or two things happened, and I'll, I'll share with that with you. You can also go to this revisions to co-ops page. You should really do that at the beginning of every year to see anything that's changed. The things that are bolded on that paper you'll see by the key on that on that document um, are the things that you need to make changes to but the things that are just listed there like sometimes we we make changes to clarify things and you don't have to make those changes on your documents or with your teachers but anyone newly downloading it would have the new information but if it's bolded then sometimes it's a uh, um, something that needs to be changed like a score that was wrong or something like that so here are some of the changes um i think i forgot to mention this actually happened uh at the end of the year uh maybe may uh we have a new civic objective uh 76 it's hospitality tourism and recreation and that encompasses our new 76.1, which is about uh, custodial technicians. So um, if you're interested in doing uh, uh, working with custodial technicians as a 243 uh, workplace co-op, that's there available for you. Uh, just a few weeks ago, after July 1, uh, we have a new 70.7, .7, and it's a revision of 70.4. Uh, one of the tasks has been removed. Um, Remember that you can always make changes uh, with approval to uh, co-ops. Uh, the original 70.4 had uh, a certain task that was specific to the agency that wrote the co-op, but it wasn't uh, acceptable to a Napa Valley Adult School. So they requested a change. We made, changed it and we have now a new 70.7. .7. That's uh, child care in the childcare area. So just know that you can do that. Uh, we also made some clarifications of languages to make things more clear. Uh, one, of the, one of the ones we did it to was 12.8. Um, there was a little bit of discrepancy as to how many uh, questions or how many items there were. And so I clarified it in this way. Most of them were very clear, but there were a couple that were written sort of in older language. And so we uh, delineated it that it's six questions, but a greeting, six questions and a closing. So that's six plus 
one plus one is eight. So there's eight items, two points each, 16 points possible. So where that needed um, clarification, we updated it. And thank you so much for bringing that to our attention that it wasn't clear. Again, we want everything to be clear for you. Um, there were also some um, uh, co-apps and it may be one that you're looking at uh, where students make a slide presentation. And we realized that we should uh, add this, uh, that their presentation should also be uh, accessible or 508 compliant. So um, we added that uh, documentation to those co-apps that um, relate to a student making a slide presentation or some kind of electronic visual. So that's an addition. A couple other things. Um, we. Uh, added the taxpayer identification number to uh, our civic objective three. So the language and literacy objective 11, we added this part in um, bold. And then it was, it was really a duplicate of 10, so we deleted number 10. So just note that. And then we also realized that uh, this is always said rating scale at the bottom of the co-op. And we realized that it's, we also talk about it being the passing score. So we, it is a rating scale, but it is also used for the passing score. So we thought we better add that language here to avoid confusion. Someone brought that to our attention again. So we're always trying to make things better. Um, any questions about these minor changes that we've made? Okay, so I just wanted to remind you that we had a number of new EL Civics co-ops last year in 2023, I think, is there 10, 10 here, I think, and uh, I added, I, I think when I showed this to you in May, I had forgotten about 76.1, or maybe we hadn't worked on it yet, I can't remember, so anyways, 76.1, it happened uh, in May of May or June of, of last year. And then we just had a new one, the one I just talked about, 70.7. We're hoping this list will be as long by the end of the year as the one from last year too. So again, if you would like to um, revise a co-op, let us know and we'll help you do that. And this is the one that that uh, Janice was talking about, the essay test or the, the 37 that now includes an essay test. Okay. Um, I just wanna give you the final results for those of you who have uh, IELCE 243 funding workplace um, uh, courses and you had to uh, submit an IELCE report. We had 112 agencies, uh, nine of them for whatever reason didn't submit uh, a report and then seven of them were rated not adequate unfortunately, but 96 were rated adequate or adequate with CDE review. That just means one or more program um, didn't have enrollment, but one, one, or one or more program did have enrollment. So we had really good statistics this year. Um, we hope you were one of the 96, and if you were one of the other ones, we hope we can help you this year to do a, a better job uh, and, and uh, get an adequate rating. We identified seven excellent agencies, and we'll be calling on those to give us presentations here at the EL Civics Network meetings and or um, conferences throughout the year. So we hope to hear from them. And then I just wanted to point out to you that uh, coming up very soon is this Enhancing Access for Refugees and New American webinar series. And there's information here, and these are links to the registration. So if you are interested in this information, um, uh, this is available to you. Any questions so far? Okay, I wanted to do a quick review of the co-op selection system since we're all starting again this year. Remember that our system starts with a school community student needs assessment. The EL Civics co-op system is based on needs assessment because we uh, research has shown that when we teach to the needs of our students that there'll be more persistence and more learning. So every year you must do that, it's up to you. Um, when you do it, we used to suggest that it was done in the spring so that then you could work on setting up your curriculum, et cetera, in the summer, and then it would be ready for fall. But you should do it however it best fits your, um, your program, as long as you do it sometime within the year. So you're going to co uh, conduct a school community needs assessment. Um, 
you can, you should, if you have 231 funding, you'll be doing it with a general content, all the content in, um, in the uh, available to you in the co-ops. And if you have 243 funding and you're working, setting up a workplace training program that you should do it in a little bit different way. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. Either way, or both, you might do both of those. You would fill out a needs assessment summary form and keep it on file describing the needs assessment. And I'm not going to talk more in detail about this here, but we do have on the CASAS website uh, a webinar, the hows and whys of EL Civics needs assessment. So if you need more information about the general needs assessment or the specific workplace needs assessment, you can um, watch that webinar, okay? But uh, there was some question about the workplace one. And so I just wanted to mention that it's a little bit different. Whereas the general one, the general needs assessment allows you to um, name a number of civic objectives or specific co-op content and then ask your students to choose which they'd like to study. The workplace one is a little different. In this case, you would be surveying the community for job opportunities first and then deciding which job training your agency or partners could offer. Then decide which workplace training your agency can offer and then develop a needs assessment related to the training. So if you have you know, three training opportunities in your school, then you would assess the needs of your students. Which of these trainings would you like to participate in, if any? So your needs assessment is done a little bit differently. But again, you don't want to offer any kind of workplace training if no students want to participate in that training. But hopefully, because you've surveyed the community, you know that there are job opportunities in your community. And so hopefully you'll have students who want to partake of those job opportunities and therefore participate in your training. And so once you've decided on the training and you've done the needs assessment, then you would choose co-ops that relate to the content of the training you're doing. And then uh, you would, the, you and the teacher or the ESL program and the CTE teacher would then decide which co-op is appropriate for that training. So it's a little bit different from the general one, but still we'd like you to fill in the needs assessment summary form and describe how you did the needs assessment. <coughs> okay, um, so once you've done your needs assessment, then you need to select the co-ops. So again, the, so the selection process is open. Um, I, I'm going to give you a tour of the website later. I'll show you where you can find that. Um, but the first time you enter um, to make your selections, you'll see a screen like this. I know these these dates are incorrect, sorry. Um, but you'll see what you what your agency chose last year. And then you can look at the version for this year to see if you want to choose it again. And then you can either um, keep it selected as it automatically selected here, or you can remove it. And then you can, can go on to continue the selection process by adding other ones you want to select or just going to checkout. Be sure you go to checkout. Okay, it's in red on the site. It says go to checkout. You have to do that in order to um, actually make the selection. The person who is designated to make these selections will receive an email verifying that your selections have been entered into the system. So if you don't get an email, that means you didn't complete the selection process. And remember that you have to, if you have any option two or three co-ops in your system, those that have been revised and are for your agency only, you need to select them every year, whether or not you intend to use them this year, because that's the only way they stay in the system. Any questions? Okay. Um, then once you've selected your co-ops, you need, you need to, or you need to ask your data person to download the co-op numbers. This is a crucial step because if they're not downloaded into the system, you won't be able to report the passing scores. So whoever's making the selections needs to identify, uh, needs to make sure to report to the person making, uh, downloading them, you know, what they're doing and any uh, teacher who might be doing a co-op needs to report which co-op they're doing again so it can be downloaded into the system. So this should be a decision made by your agency, but I know some of you small agencies, individual teachers sometimes do that. Just be sure that it's reported into the into your data person and that the data person or whoever's taking care of it is downloading 
uh, into the into TE. Now here, I'm trying to have any trouble. There we go. So in this place, and this is where you can find where you download. Uh, only pe designated people can look and see how to download. But I have um, <clears throat> put it also in as a PDF for those of you for whatever reason don't have access but still need the information. So just so you know, it can be downloaded here. This information or um, in the PDF section of the Yale Civics website. Um, you should always uh, check the revision to co-ops document. Again, that tells you what's new in the system and what changes have been made. So at the beginning of the year, please do that. And then periodically in the year, you can look at, look at that. If you wish anything that's in green is something that's added new. But if, I, if we do make a change that is mandatory for you to make, we will be notifying your agency about that. So looking at this more than once a year is not as crucial to you as it might be as you might think. Okay, um, remember that the Yale Civic System is pay for performance. Learners can earn up to six uh, payment points per year based on taking the assessments, three from 231 funding and three from 243 funding. If you wanna know which co-ops, um, well, all the co-ops are 231 funded, but if you wanna know which one are 243 funded, you can go to this document. Uh, on the Yale Civics webpage to let you know which are 243 funded. And remember that Yale Civics payment points are earned on the condition of taking a CASAS pre and post test. One, of course, that is approved, uh, a reading or listening test that is approved by the NRS. Um, I'm not going to read this, but this is information about co-op record keeping, what kind of records you need to keep. We get these questions every year, so I wanted to put that here for you. And uh, just to tell you about the submissions deadlines, at least one co-op must be submitted by October 31st. So please go in and make a selection. This is just to let us know that you can access the system or the designated person from your agency can access the system. If you have any problems accessing and you are the designated person, please contact your program specialist. But please don't wait to the last minute on this. Just go in and make your selection. You can always change what you've selected. This first deadline is just to make sure you can access the system. It's not crucial that all your ducks be in a row before you do this. But do remember that April 30th of the program year is the last day to add editor elite co-ops. And so make sure that they've all been selected so that you can make sure to earn your payment points. Okay, so I have a few direct messages and I'll answer them. I'll answer them directly to you. Uh, Later. Well, let me just mention, uh, so uh, Kristen asked about a good way to survey the community about job opportunities. Um, if any of you would like to share how you do that, that would be great here. But uh, it's important to talk with your workforce Im investment boards. Also, very often your um, CTE courses have advisory committees, and they would be the best to know, um, you know what job opportunities are available. Would anybody like to share and answer that question about how you survey the community about job opportunities? I think the two suggestions I gave are, are, are good ones, but hope, I'm sure there are more. Okay, I wanted to go to the web, web page and then, uh, I'm wondering if we should go to citizenship prep first and let me do this afterwards. Those of you who need to go, go on the tour, um, what do you think, Portia? What would you like to do? Would you like to go ahead and do your sit prep slides and then I'll do this tour afterwards? Yeah, I can do that, Lori. Okay, why don't we do that? And so uh, those of you who want a tour of the website, I know so many of you are so familiar with it, but I wanted to make sure that we touched on where these documents can be found. Uh, but I will do that afterwards. Why don't we move to Portia and then um, I can come back to this tour, those of you who want to go on a tour of the website. So here we are, citizenship preparation. We have Portia LaFerla to tell Thanks us. Thanks so much, Lori. Uh, so most of you already know, but there are two um, 
payment points for citizenship preparation under WIOA 2. And these are in addition to the three that you can get for 231 EL Civics and the three that you can get for 243 EL Civics. One of those payments is the SIT or the citizenship interview test. And that is a one on one oral interview. Um, it can be given to high beginning through advanced level students. And it predicts the um, readiness of a student to pass the USCIS naturalization interview. <clears throat> and next slide, Lori. It takes about uh, 15 to 20 minutes to administer, and it must be administered by a SIT certified examiner. So somebody at your agency must um, go through the training and become certified to give this oral interview and score it. You can order that on the um, CASAS webpage, and there's a link on this slide to that. It takes about, oh, I would say anywhere from three to five hours to complete that training. The people that complete it the fastest are the ones that really pay attention to what they're doing and who use the scoring documents and all the rest of the documentation that's given during the training. So um, my suggestion is if you would like to become SIT certified, take your time and um, you'll pass much more quickly. There's no charge to WIOA funded agencies, um, and there is a video on our YouTube channel showing you the steps that you take to sign up because it can get confusing. Next slide, Lori. Uh, the certification is open now. So if you have somebody who wants to or needs to get initial certification, you can go onto the CASAS website and sign up now. They can, you can certify or they can certify now. And that certification expires on June um, on June 30th of one or two program years later, depending on the date when you first certify. It's done completely online. And once you complete the certification process, you'll be notified of that. Recertification happens annually. That course opens at the beginning of January and both certification and recertification close on April 30th. And if you want more information, you can contact sit at casas.org, or you can call the number that's on this slide. But any inquiry about sit should go to sit at casas.org, and either I or selling your flag will respond to you. Next one, Lori. Um, both the sit and government and history can be offered remotely. If you're offering the sit remotely, you can order PDFs that you can use for remote scoring, but only for remote assessment. Otherwise, order the booklets 973, 974, and you can score directly in those booklets. And again, there is no charge for any of that. And the next one. Uh, the Government in History is a listening test. It takes about 20 to 25 minutes, and it is based on um, knowledge of basic American government history. And it's based on the current 100 questions. It can be given through e-testing or through paper testing. And again, there is a remote option using a flash drive, but that's not the preferred method for this test. Um, although the SIT is probably only of interest to your students who are preparing for citizenship, the government history test may be of wide interest to your ESL students. And if you're interested in offering that test, you can contact me and I can give you more um, information about how you can do both EL Civics um, 231 civic participation and citizenship preparation for your students. And we, CASAS is monitoring the um, USCIS proposed changes to the naturalization tests. No decision has been made. Some field testing will be happening soon, but we are um, monitoring that. And should we need to adapt our tests or otherwise change, um, as I say, CASAS is monitoring that and we will, um, we will keep in step with that. And if you're interested in following along, there is a live link on this slide that you can use to, um, to get more information about that redesign. And if you want to contribute information about um, uh, your thoughts on that. Okay, then I think that's the last one, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, any, oh, oh. any questions? The, the testing one, pre and post test. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, thank you, Lauren. Yeah, um, and for to as for all EL Civics payment points, um, all, all CASAs, I'm sorry, we owe two payment points, you must have a valid, the student must have a valid pre-post test pair by through an NRS approved CASAs test, either reading or listening. 
Thank you so much, Portia. Any questions for Portia about citizenship preparation? Okay, and thank just you, Lori. thank you. And while um, Portia was talking, Larry Ann uh, answered um, Kristen's question about uh, job opportunities. And she said, we have a virtual job board and we have the employment connection partner on our campus once a week to assist with employment opportunities. So hopefully that would uh, give you information as to what training to offer as well, this person. And then Marin asked if Larry Ann would, would share what it looked like so that she could get ideas. So I don't know, Larry Ann, if you're still here, but if you can share that with us, or if you share that with me later, I will send that out to everyone if you would like it to be shared. But thank you, Marin, for your question also. Okay, so just some other information. These are the dates for our next meetings, August 30th, November 1st, and December 6th. They're all posted on the website. You can go ahead and register so that you'll get a reminder closer to the time. The Monday before, I always send out a reminder. Um, and so, uh, Again, if you're on my Yale Civics Network list, you'll get a reminder. And if you haven't already, please type your name and agency into the chat box. And after this meeting, please register at caadultedtraining.org. You can do it through tomorrow, uh, just to so we have a record of your attendance. Um, any questions? Okay, I said I would do a tour of the website. Some of you are interested in that and some of you are not. If you need to leave at this point, that's great. I mean, I understand and I didn't mean to say, and uh, let me just go back to our list of what we wanted to, um, what I wanted to show you. Yeah, I wanna show you some of these things. So I'm gonna make this a little smaller, hopefully so I can remember that. And let me take you to the CASAS website. Uh, those of you who want to stay, it's been lovely being with you, those of you who are leaving, and uh, we'll see you next time, August 30th. And if you or any of your colleagues would like to share uh, any programs that you are working with, we would love to have you uh, present at our meeting. Sorry, my web, somehow my page, is there we go, is getting slow. So let me share a new share with you and I went directly to the page. I hope you all know how to get here. I think you do. So this is our EL Civics webpage. Everything on it has been updated as we mentioned. These four first four items are the most important items. Um, this is the pre-approved uh, additional assessment plan list. Uh, if you wanna just look in general for um, the co-ops you might wanna look at. This is for those of you who are going to be doing the selection, the designated people who can select co-ops. Um, we're really, most people are not using these number two and number three anymore. This is the one you would use, select pre-approved co-ops. And then again, if this is the first time you're doing that in the season, you'll get that, uh, that uh, screen that I showed you earlier with the radial dots of things that your agency selected last year. But that's that. Let me see. Okay. And I want to show you that in this first gray, this first box, EL Civics Co-op Development, uh, are all the downloadable documents that you might need. So this first section, again, of, of PDFs is really important. Here's the revisions to co-ops document. Um, here's the pre-approved civic objectives list uh, that shows all the language and literacy objectives. And here is the list of um, 231 and 243 funded documents, okay? Other important documents are the IELCE FAQs. Most of the time when you send me a question, I'm getting the information from here. So I would love it if you would look here first. For example, the record keeping um, uh, is there. Uh, lots of questions that have been asked over the year are in this document. So love it if you would look at that first. If any new thing happens, it'll be in green. Otherwise, everything is available um, uh, and true for the program year 23-24. Okay. Oh, and uh, here we go. Here's the document we just posted, how to download co-ops into TE. It's the same thing you could find at that other link I showed you, but uh, anyone can access this for some reason, only designated persons can access the other one. 
I wanted to show you that we've got lots and lots of slideshows, pretty much everything you want to know about EL Civics, um, California EL Civics Basics, Civic Participation, and IELCE requirements. If you're new to EL Civics, you will want to uh, listen to that webinar. Here are the slides. If you want more information about EL Civics co-ops, you would go to this next one. And again, here are the slides. So pretty much everything you need to know is here. <laughs> So please look here for content information. Uh, and then lots of other things here. So scroll down and look. Oh, here's the information about how to give a needs assessment. Um, so all the information about needs assessment is here also. So if you need to do that, please do. And um, We added these two uh, curriculum information uh, documents that we've talked about in the past, Integrated Education and Training Design Toolkit. And I wanna point out this social justice resources document that OTAN, uh, Cape Tap and CASAS uh, collaborated on to give teachers resources in how to teach uh, culture and uh, social justice issues. So, that is basically what I wanted to show you. Let me just look at my list. Oh, oh, one more thing, two more things. And that is on the upper left-hand side here, we have two important things. One is California Title II Program Specialist. So if you don't know who your program, CASAS Program Specialist is, you click on that. And then there's a list based on the area you are in as to who your program specialist is. And then if you want to know who your CDE consultant is, you need to email this address. But uh, the list here of names and rate areas are for your CASAS program specialist. And one last thing, oh, no, I wanted to show you, is the EL Civic Support Channel. So the EL Civic Support Channel and Citizenship Preparation has one too on their website, uh, web page. EL Civic Support Channel has all the things you might need. One of the things it has or will have in uh, is the uh, recording. So I'm going to send you a recording, those of you who, who are on my list. But if for some reason you don't have it in the future, you can find all the recordings for the EL Civics Network meetings here. Um, there's a lot of information here. Another one I will point out are the agency examples. These are presentations that that your colleagues have given at the EL Civics Network meeting uh, to talk about their programs. We have business office skills. Um, uh, I should actually put the title security guard and welding. A lot of uh, examples here that your colleagues have shared about what they're doing at their agencies. So the EL Civic Support Channel is something we would love you to be looking at. Any questions or anything else you want to know about on the EL Civics website? Okay, great. And Larry Ann said that she created a Padlet and she updates the site and the Navigator Employment Connection can upload current openings. And um, she gave you her email address. So if you want more information about that, um, she I'm sure she will let you, she will give you that information. Any questions, last questions? Okay, I wanna thank you so much for attending today. Our next meeting again is August 30th. I hope I will see you then. And if you have any questions between now and then, uh, please email me at either elcivics at casas.org or lbhoward at casas.org. Larry Ann, thank you for agreeing to, to take people's questions. That's very kind of you. Um, all of the slides and documents that were talked about today will be sent to you if you're on the EL Civics Network meeting list. If you want to be on that list and you aren't already, please email me at lbhoward at casas.org. Uh, and I will put you on the list and then send you this information. Hope you have the great rest of your summer and I will see you on August 30th. Bye-bye. <laughs>